All right, good evening, everyone. We're gonna jump right in. Welcome to SHAPE session two. My name is Celeste and I'm the Administrative Coordinator for the Equality State Policy Center. And we're so excited to have you here tonight. The Equality State Policy Center is a nonpartisan nonprofit organization working to improve the lives of Wyoming's people through transparent government, fair elections, and thriving communities. Shape Wyoming is designed to create citizens lobbyists from everyday people, those most affected by our issues. We hope to create the next group of activists ready to engage the legislature. When you use your voice, we can accomplish our goals together. We're gonna jump into a little conversation about our goals for today's session. Um, so, we would really like you guys to get a better understanding of grassroots organizing and what that looks like in Wyoming, learn how to build a grassroots campaign, and also learn the power and the importance of your story and start to build that. And last but not least, we're going to wrap it up with how to effectively advocate with your story. And that learning will be through our lovely expert panelist here. Today we have joining us Rachel Martinez. Rachel is the executive director of the Wyoming Civic Engagement Network. Born and raised in Wyoming, she takes it very personally when, the home, when her home is not living up to the name as the Equality State. From a young age, Rachel was active in the community with her family, whether it was helping with, oops, sorry, helping provide meals to homeless or neighborhood cleanups. She saw early on someone could positively make a difference in others' lives. She currently holds leadership roles in organizations such as the Hispanic Organization for Progress and Education, Wyoming Girls on the Run, and much more. Rachel resides in Cheyenne with her husband, where they've raised their three children and now spend as many free moments as they can with her grandson. Next, we have Rob Joyce, who works with community members, volunteers, and partner organizations to help build grassroots power and advocate for a just transition to a renewable energy future. He currently serves as the conservation organizer with the Wyoming chapter of the Sierra Club. We also have Marcy Kindred, who's a real estate saleswoman in Cheyenne, Wyoming, a wife and a mom. You might recognize her from her time with ESPC as a storyteller and story collector for the Medicaid expansion efforts in Wyoming. And last but not least, we have Carly Provenza, who is an expert in the American legal system, the product of a working class family and a community advocate. She founded Albany County for Proper Policing in 2018 to advocate for transparency and accountability in law enforcement after the killing of Robbie Ramirez. ACOP built an effective grassroots movement that resulted in change in Albany County. Carly serves as the executive director of ACOP and is a Wyoming state representative for House District 45. And with that, I am gonna hand it over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Celeste. Thank you for being here tonight and making time in your schedule. Thanks to ESBC for having me and honored to be presenting among some other great panelists. So I start off with a picture of the Lorax to start this presentation and with a disclaimer that grassroots organizing is a dynamic and constantly evolving process. And we see the themes of grassroots organizing in the story of the Lorax, a cautionary tale about a person's responsibilities to the environment. And Dr. Seuss introduces the Onceler um, a reckless entrepreneur whose unfettered ambition leads to the destruction of, of the immediate environment, right? And lives are affected negatively. And everyone's trying, the Lorax is trying to convince the one slur to stop, but to no avail. And the environment's completely decimated before the one slur realizes the harm he's caused. But the story is also a hopeful account with the ending that, um, of possible environmental restoration once the Wensler accepts responsibility and all the players that help the Lorax to stand up for what is right. So what I think the Lorax shows us is it's easy for all of us to come up very quickly in our minds when we think about grassroots organizing and grassroots movements that have taken place and what part we've played in local movements or causes. But whatever part of the movement that we enter and whatever stage that is, there's a multitude of things that need to happen to get true movement and grassroots growth. And wanna just talk to you a little bit about my personal experiences with that. I'm born and raised in Wyoming, and I just love this state to death and I don't wanna leave. I want to improve it. I want my kids to be able to come back here and, um, and, and work and contribute, right? To, there's so many beautiful things about it. But often we see that media, politics, tragedy, and and social issues can divide us, which leads us to that certain sudden urge to get together and do something about it, right? And take a stance that will get noticed and lead to changes. 
But the same urgency that's needed to get a movement going can also be the very thing that causes a grassroots movement to be less effective. I wanna share with you today a few things that I can help to really stabilize a grassroots campaign and keep the grass growing. It comes from my personal experiencing experiences, learning a lot of what I could have done different or better, right? Oftentimes we wanna know what should not we do. And, but mostly my grassroots experience has led me to meet some pretty amazing people all over the country, all over my state. It's connected me globally, locally, and when I get overwhelmed, I really feel that grassroots organizing has helped me realize I'm, I'm not alone and that there is hope for our future. So I want to um, start off and show a quick video from my personal heroine, Dolores Huerta. I'm Dolores Huerta and I am 87 years old and I have been an activist since I was 25. That's 62 years and I'm still going strong. I do believe that the people that are being affected by the issues are the best ones that can solve them. We started the uh, National Farm Workers Association with Cesar Chavez, which became the United Farm Workers of America. Knowing that ordinary people have the power to come together to organize and that they can change policies, this is what really engaged me and really changed my life. And eventually I left being a school teacher uh, to become an organizer. The pivotal moment in my life uh, came when I met this great man named Fred Roth Sr. And I went to a meeting where he showed us uh, pictures of people who had organized themselves. By registering to vote, uh, he elected the first Latino to the Los Angeles City Council. The most effective way uh, to make changes is by organizing, especially at the grassroots level. I call going door to door, canvassing, organizing 101 because this is where you can really engage with the voter and explain the issues to them. People get confused and so they just throw up their hands and they don't vote. But we have to say to people, vote for what you're confident in voting, even if you have to leave some of the spaces blank. The important thing is to get in there and vote. We're seeing a new dawn of resistance, a new dawn of movements. And if we don't act responsibly, if we don't engage, then we have only ourselves to blame. Great, so we can see that um, grassroots movements and organizing, it's, it's a very simple, uh, seems simple, right? And, and what the issue is, is that it's, it's the basis for a political, social, or economic movement. And these movements leverage us collectively to form action, from the people, like Dolores said, that are being impacted at the ground level to influence decision makers at that top level and drive favorable policy changes. I think that's the ultimate goal when I think about grassroots um, campaigning. So she, she mentioned listening to the community who's affected by the issue. I grew up in a, a, a Latino household. It was actually a, a mixed Latino household. So we have um, Spanish and um, Mexican-American uh, culture, right, which is completely different countries. So I was, I kind of had an identity crisis growing up, like, who was I? And my dad always said, you're a Chicana. Well, what does that even mean? What does that mean, dad? I don't know what that means. But it was impressed upon me at a very young age that an individual person could take a stance. And it seemed like in our household, we were always boycotting something, whether it was not shopping at the Gap because of the sweatshops, or not eating produce. Um, I was, I was born after the lettuce and the great boycotts of the United Farm Workers, but it seemed like we were always, don't eat that because we have to, you know, support the farm workers, which my grandparents worked in the fields along Nebraska and Texas and Wyoming. And I became accustomed to the boycott life, but I didn't really understand the whys behind it. So when I got to college, I joined Mecha, and that's the Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano de Aslan. And it was a, a very Mexican-American um, forward student organization rooted in the civil rights era. And it focused on building capacity of Latinos to show pride in culture and work towards social justice and equity. I really began to make the connection between what I could do as an individual to the power of grassroots organizing and the power behind um, bringing together the masses. And that's actually when I took part in my first sit-in when I grabbed my dog because she's old and she's just um, has 
has doggy issues. <laughs> and I was like, wow, that was really powerful to experience that sit in, right? And and meet with others that um, shared the same cause and to actually then go on the news and talk about what we were doing. And it was also really scary, <laughs> but I, I, I got into that. And then you move towards empowering and building leadership within because you really need that, um, it, that leadership to truly take the grassroots campaign to the, to the, that higher level of affecting the change. So some important factors that I've learned in doing the work at the various levels is it takes time and patience, right? And oftentimes it, we, we say this during a lot of things, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And a lot of times with these very candid issues, we want things to change so fast and, and they need to change fast. We're, we're addressing some very serious and tragic issues that are happening in our community. And we really wanna move fast, but it does take time and patience. And it is so great when people come to marches and they hold up signs and they yell some chants, but we know what's very effective and important is the work that was put in to get to that point and the work that's gonna be done after that point, right? To continue to grow that movement. And then we have the learning and adapting and that's the follow-up and the communi continued communication that cannot be underscored enough. And that's how leadership has grown within the grassroots work. So you may have a few people, I, I took part in a, a lot of um, campaigns um, that it was just a few of us getting together and really doing the core work. And then we needed to bring other people along because we, you know, we have full-time jobs, we, we have families, we can't sustain the level of work that was needed to continue to, to bring that issue alive. So we had to bring other people along and empower others to really also use their vo voice, to give their time and energy. And it's hard when you don't know if your efforts are going to be rewarded with true change that you, you wanna see, but I, um, that learning and adapting is so important and, and being able to say, you know what, we could have done this a different way um, or we could have learned or we could have done this and that, that's really important as well. And, um, and quantifying your efforts, I think is also important if you can really show numbers and you can really show how that changes um, being done, that's really important to legislators and decision makers when they actually see how the bottom dollar is being affected and how the how how this could actually be a beneficial impact financially to the state as well as um, collectively. That's that's what they want to that's what they want to see oftentimes. So the one pitfall that I think is really important to avoid is not having that strong leadership base from the onset. So oftentimes leaders will have to focus on the base building and working on that very important ground level, but making sure to designate those leaders aside from that base building will go a long way from staying um, horizontal and actually moving and growing vertically. So if we can go on to the next slide, Celeste, um, I, I wanted to put um, some different levels of community organizing and they all kind of um, lead to that last bullet point of lasting social change. And, and so I, I kind of put examples here of, of the various different levels, but I also want to use my, um, my volunteering and my grassroots work with um, Healthy Wyoming and Medicaid expansion and healthcare access. It's something that's been really important to me. I worked with Enroll Wyoming and with the marketplace, and I got to travel all across the state and see how many people depended on that insurance, the marketplace insurance, because they didn't have it through work and they couldn't afford it on the private market. Also, um, how many more people could be covered if we do expand Medicaid? And so I actually was out there talking to the people that were impacted and, um, and trying to, to get, so that's just very important to me. So at the service level, that is when you think about, um, when I'm talking about them, um, trying to get Medicaid expansion passed. Maybe when I was working in Family Promise, it was just doing a, a specific service, like providing discount cards, providing the prescription discount cards to my, um, my families that didn't have insurance, but maybe that could just help them, right, to get some basic prescriptions. So that's at the very service level that anybody can really do. Provide a ride to the clinic, refer somebody to the low-income clinic. That's a very base, uh, basic aspect of, of service. And then that advocacy, that's where everyone can do advocacy. 
They can promote the issue. They can spread the word. They can make calls. Calling your elected officials is so important. And I really worked with my nonprofit to just provide basic, unbiased, nonpartisan facts on on what is Medicaid expansion? What are we talking about? Where can you get that unbiased information? And then how is that going to impact you? Because we want you also talking to, in your own voice with your own words to, to those that are making the decision. The next level is mobilizing. So with the help of the other organizations in my, um, um, in my circle of work, I created a, helped create a homeless collaborative. And we focused on Medicaid expansion as a group why that was important to the um, people that we served that were coming to our organization seeking services. We invited in legislators um, just to have conversations and trying to help towards that bigger cause. So that's really where the mobilizing can happen. And we had people come and talk to us um, about their impact of not having insurance. So that that was really a, a part of it. And then the activism is taking that next step, right? Just really, door-to-door -door canvassing, phone banking, online organizing. I know that some people, we were talking about it earlier, they would rather like, you know, pass a kidney stone than knock on a door. But, <laughs> you know, you, you bring people to that level. If they start out and you're just having that constant communication with them from the very beginning of, of the service all the way down to the activism level, then that's really what true community organizing is. Taking all those multifaceted layers and then hopefully getting to that last bullet point of lasting social change. So for me, I think it's really important for me to share that we meet people where they're at and their comfort level along the spectrum is important and, and just empowering people as they can. And sometimes the people that are the most quiet in the back of the room ultimately become the leaders, right, in a grassroots movement. Um, so that's what I have to say, and uh, I will I'll pass it on to the, the next person. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel, um, and thanks everybody for joining. Um, thanks, Celeste, for, for having us. And yeah, my name is Rob Joyce. I'm an organizer for the Sierra Club. I live here in Laramie. Um, I've lived here for about Oh, 15 years now, um, and I've been doing organizing work with the Sierra Club for, for the last four. Um, so I still still have a lot to learn. I still feel like I'm fairly new to organizing in the organizing space, but thought I could share um, some tools and tips, uh, things that I've found to be useful in, in building grassroots campaigns in, in Wyoming um, and share them with you all. Starting with um, what I think is one of the most important pieces is, is having a collective vision and, and using that for setting our goals when we're working with with or within a community. Um, it's for me based on the understanding that very few, if any, issues exist uh, in isolation. Everything is connected in my mind and, and having a shared vision for the world that we're actually trying to build can really help us stay, stay rooted in our, our community values um, and help us create and, and set goals that um, we can hold ourselves account accountable to based on based on those values and and that shared vision that we're trying to create. Um, some questions that that I ask when I am working to to kind of create a, a shared collective vision is is what is the world that that you want to live in? Um, what does your community want or need right now? What problems are are we facing? Um, and what steps do we need to take to get there? Um, there are, there are a lot of ways to do this. Rachel already mentioned uh, a number of them. Um, doing one-on-ones, um, canvassing, door knocking, phone banking, having community meetings. These are all really important to actually, as an organizer, spend a lot of time on. And I, I really wanna stress that point. If you're not accountable to the people that, that you're working for and with, um, you're gonna create campaigns that are, that are unstable later on. So um, the last thing I wanted to mention in, in the photo actually in this, um, in this slide is a, um, a visual uh, that was created by uh, the National Sierra Club to kind of uh, show what our, our policy vision is for the next five years or the next four years in this case. Um, and I, I want to, I added this in here because I think it's important one to have your vision written down, sure, but also to make it fun, um, to have activities that actually get people to have a sensory experience when they're trying to create their vision or actually can see themselves living in a, in a better and brighter future. Um, 
and to come together and, and create in uh create art or song or, or anything that kind of taps into our our most uh human emotions and, and gets us connected to where we want to go um, can be really empowering for a lot of people. So I um, wanted to include that instead of a bunch of bullet points on, on where we're trying to go. But um, the next piece I wanted to talk about is, is power. Um, there's a lot of definitions in movement space and organizing space for, for what power means. There's a lot of different types of power, um, but I wanted to share this, this one tool that, that has helped me. Um, so at the very, um, at its very basic sense, power is the ability to act and, and create change. That's the definition I use anyway. Um, and I think as, as organizers or folks who are, are wanting to um, tackle issues in our communities, I think we should be asking an important question uh, when we build our campaigns, which is how do we build the power that we need to make the changes that we need to, to reach our goals and, and our vision? So uh, I wanted to share this, this helpful tool. Uh, it comes from a researcher named Arkan Fung, who's run, uh, a researcher with uh, um, something called the Gettysburg Project in, in Harvard. Um, but it's an introduction to the, the four levels of power. So understanding where power lies within these four levels can help us better understand what interventions we might need uh, in order to achieve our goals. In our, in our overall vision. So I'll go through them really quickly here. Um, and I, I'm gonna be reading a little bit from my notes. Um, the first is everyday politics or advocating uh, for individual redress. So that might be something like um, obtaining justice for an individual who has been harmed. Um, say there's pollution in uh, an oil and gas field that's in someone's backyard and um, you can intervene as a community or as an organization to help that person get out of that situation. Um, the second is winning policy, so that would be something like passing passing a law that protects a whole class of people. Um, something that I think we're probably most familiar with when when it comes to organizing, um, or what we see like most organizations doing is is trying to pass a law or a policy. Um, the third is structural power, or, or what um, they describe as changing the playing field. Um, that might be um, something like electing a leader from your group into a, a elected position to have more control um, or a negative example might be something like gerrymandering. So actually changing voting districts to give you an advantage in, uh, in a political uh, challenge. And the last one is, is ethical or epistemic or what I typically would call cultural power. Um, these are changing values, beliefs and narratives, something that we're gonna talk more about um, today and it's often the hardest to define and the hardest to actually change. It's very difficult to to change someone's values, but their beliefs and their um, the way they interact with the world is something that um, that we need to be considering as organizers. Um, an example of that um, might be, say, the majority of people in a population believe climate change needs to be addressed, mitigated, and or exists if you're in certain parts of of the world. Um, and that's that's something that I've been working on over the last, uh, I guess, since I started working for the Sierra Club. Um, so this, this tool provides a framework for how power exists in, in our society, but I think it can also help us better understand our issues and what tactics and, and which targets we might want to prioritize. So say we're in a situation where we know we need to pass a certain law um, or to win a policy, but we know the structural playing field and the cultural um, uh, or dominant culture is leveraged against us. We might then make our decision saying, well, we need to, to make some, uh, some effort into shifting culture and, and leveling that playing field however we can in order to, to eventually achieve our goal of, of, um, of passing a policy or a law. Um, one last thing I, I wanted to know about power, and this is something Rachel has already mentioned, but I think is really important is as we do this power analysis, we should also be looking um, internally and do a self-assessment of, of our community's power um, is incredibly important. We should, we should know how large our base is, um, what our support is within a community, what's our work capacity, who is our base. Um, if, if our base are primar primarily people working nine to five and have families, um, our ability to show up, our capacity to engage in in these spaces is going to be limited. Whereas if our, our base is largely maybe students or uh, you know another population might uh, uh, end up using different tactics or even prioritizing a different target, which I'll, I'll get to in a second. Um, 
the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is what skills does your community have? I'm a firm believer that everyone has a place in, in movement spaces, whether you're able to public speak or able to code or not comfortable doing any of these things, but just want to um, come and become educated. Um, the connections that, that we make together, I think, is, is really where we, we have our power. So making our spaces inviting, I think, is, is actually one of the, the key pieces to building, starting to build power. Um, and the last one is, is assessing what connections we, we have to decision makers. And that's in the next slide. My, um, my first uh, piece is, is identifying our key targets and decision makers. Um, as we know, decisions are not made you know, out of thin air, there's there's actually people behind the policy and, and laws that are passed. Um, so as we get to understand our communities, do a power analysis, both of our issue and, and of ourselves, um, we'll, we'll eventually get to a point of who is the key decision maker in this, um, in this situation and how do we influence them? Or if they're uninfluenceable <laughs> in, in our case, is there a way that we can change the playing field and, and, and have a decision maker who is more aligned with our values. Um, from there, you'll, uh, as I kind of already got into, start developing your tactics that will kind of start moving the needle towards towards your goals. And lastly, um, you'll be able to engage your broader base of support. So as Rachel mentioned, it's really important to have key leaders, folks who are willing to and able to dedicate um, more time to kind of developing the strategy and, and um, you know, the folks making the phone calls and doing the canvassing to build the power that you need. But at the end, um, campaigns and, and pieces of movement that are accountable to large bases of people are the ones that are going to be the most stable. Um, last thing I, I wanted to mention on this slide is, um, it's really important. And I think it's something that we often don't do as, or um, I, I guess I personally don't always prioritize is debriefing um, and actually looking back on what what happened during the campaign and when you um, deployed a tactic? Did you win? Did you achieve your goal? Why or why not? Um, campaigning is usually an iterative process. It's something that um, really will spur on to, uh, you know, more and more work, <laughs> for lack of a better word, I guess. Um, so taking the time to kind of slow down and, and connect, reconnect with your community and ask, um, did this represent, you know, what we wanted and if not how do we do it better the next time is, is really important um and the, on my last slide i just wanted to um share i guess some some few things to consider that maybe are not specific to wyoming but i found to be incredibly incredibly important um the first is is simply that we're stronger together i've mentioned this i think five times now but the the power of collective action really shouldn't be overestimated, I think it often is. Um, while minor wins do sometimes happen with the right series of personal connections and, and like tactics, um, uh, campaigns that are, that are again accountable, accountable to the people in the community are, are often the ones that are the most successful. And I wanted to share this, this photo on the right, which is actually from um, 2019 during a, a youth climate strike here in Laramie. That was, um, a few hundred high schoolers coming out to to protest climate inaction uh, downtown. This actually predated um, some work that that we did with with really strong community leaders and using a lot of the campaign tactics that I mentioned to to pass a carbon neutral resolution down. Um, and I, I just wanted to use it as an example that you know those those activities and those tactics and you know developing leaders and putting staff time and um, didn't come from nowhere. Um, it, it was after years of public support, um, protesting, showing that the system isn't necessarily working fast enough, um, really helped us prove that, um, that we had the base of support we needed to, to make meaningful policy change in the end. Um, uh, second point is, is that we're small Wyoming population wise, maybe not geographically, but um, but we're connected. Um, this is something, one of the main takeaways that I've taken from SHAPE trainings in the past, and I've done quite a few of them, um, is that our elected officials are oftentimes our neighbors, uh, folks that we bump into on a regular basis. Um, and this is something that is really unique to Wyoming and it's something, a tool, a unique tool that we can use um, to kind of grow our, grow our power, but also make meaningful, uh, meaningful connections with our elected officials, uh, one of which is 
on the panel and we'll be speaking later. Um, and the last one is um, that story and narrative really does matter. And I wanted to highlight that your personal story matters most actually, um, if you're if you're willing and able to develop it in, in a way that helps you, um, you know, move the needle towards towards the vision, towards the better kind of future that, that we're all working towards. So um, I know we're, we're moving into the narrative piece, so I wanted to, to leave it there. Um, so thanks, thanks all so much and uh, looking forward to hearing the rest of the panel. Hello, I'm Marcy Kindred here in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And despite a very inconveniently timed cold and laryngitis, I am here to tell you, to talk to you about the power of storytelling, no matter how strong the um, actual voice is. It's the storytelling factor of building these movements. Um, and to do that, I'm going to surprise no one and share a few stories. Um, first of my grandpa, Thomas Verdell Campbell. Those are the pictures that you're seeing on the screen right now. The one with the wonderful 90s haircut and the bangs and the ears that I never quite grew into. That's me, uh, my grandpa with my oldest son, who he also has not grown into his ears. Um, and then over here, this was last Thanksgiving when my grandpa told, uh, retold from memory one of the epic poems. I can't remember specifically which one that he, he told from memory. And it was one of those Greek poems. And he held a room full of children's attention for the duration of that poem. Um, and a Last year, I found a project that I had written in middle school, and it was called Grandpa Stories. And I remember this project, and I had been asked to read this project to other classrooms, go to other schools to present this project. And when I found it this past year, it just, it connected all these dots for me my entire life has been based in stories, everything I do. At the time of finding the story, I was working for the Equality State Policy Center um, with the coalition Healthy Wyoming on expanding Medicaid in here in Wyoming. And I had the position of story collector. My day job as a real estate agent, I basically write stories about houses and why you should fall in love with them. That's what a listing description is. Everything in my life is based around storytelling. And everything based in grassroots organizing is based in storytelling and utilizing and using the collective power of our individual stories to build a collective narrative. Um, one of the the opening line of that project called Grandpa Story says some of my very first memories go back to Sunday afternoons as a little girl, bursting through Grandpa Campbell's door, flying to his easy chair and pleading, Grandpa, tell me a story. He's the one that instilled in me my love for storytelling and the dramatics. Here we are. Um, I also have a theater background. And what is really significant and what we can draw from my grandpa, Thomas Verdell Campbell, is the power of his storytelling. I mean, he, he passed it on to his children and grandchildren, but my grandpa also has quite the list of accolades to his name. My, my grandpa served as um, mayor of the town <clears throat> that, he, that I was born in, Idaho Falls, for 16 years. 16 years after he left four terms, they did change the term limits. He can now only serve two terms, but he was so beloved and did so much good for his town that they just, they kept electing him. There's a monument in his honor at the Green Belt. If you ever go to Idaho Falls, Idaho, there's a lovely Green Belt around the Snake River that my grandpa convinced this town to pay more taxes so that they could fund this walk around the Snake River. And he did that by telling the story, the vision of what this would do for their community. 
Um, there's gymnasium named after him. And it, it's all based in storytelling. And um, yeah, so that's, that's, my, that's where I got my, my start in storytelling. And if we'll go to the next slide, I'll, I'll go into my story of why I am here now on a panel talking about storytelling in Wyoming, grassroots organizing building. Um, my life didn't quite go as planned. I was headed off to college, had some scholarships, and I found myself pregnant at 19. And so my life took a drastically different turn than what I envisioned. Um, I married my, I married a lifelong Wyomingite. He brought me here from Utah and we entered into this cycle that many, many find themselves in when they have children that young of poverty. And it took me 10 years of raising children and living in poverty and struggling to make ends meet and benefiting from the programs such as food stamps and Medicaid as it currently sits. I also struggled where our Medicaid system fails many young mothers when as soon as I had my children, I was dropped off of healthcare here in Wyoming. Um, I, we participated in the rent voucher system, we, all of it. And even with all of that help, there is still so much lacking in our social safety nets that it took over a decade. And I am a lucky one. I am a lucky one that I was able to pull my family out of that cycle of poverty um, when I entered real estate at the perfect time, right? Everybody knows what's happened with real estate in the last 10 years. And I got into it four years ago, just at the peak of the boom. And it really just changed my life. And it changed it so quickly and drastically that it was still, it still is fresh in my mind. And when my friends started getting involved in some of the grassroots advocacy, work here in Wyoming. I think the very first, first form of that um, was for the big box tax, if anybody remembers that push. Uh, healthy, no, it wasn't healthy, it was Better Wyoming was doing some work to push the, the big box tax. We're trying to tax corporate um, to bring in some money for our general fund. And I went, some friend dragged me to a grassroots meeting like we've been talking about and they were talking about all the different ways you can get involved here's all the reasons why we need this tax passed and here are all the ways that you can get involved we can make phone calls we can write legislators we can give test public testimony in front of the legislature and that one is really hard to find people to do but that happens to be the one for me that takes the least amount of effort that is the thing that I do um, in my sleep. I can tell stories, I can talk, I enjoy public speaking, this is fun for me. And so when I said like, can I do that? I think that the organizers were like, yes, you can, you want to do that? Yes, please. And so I started showing up at these legislative meetings um, and these committee meetings and started giving testimony. And it was incredible to me to watch the direct effect that it had, whether or not the vote went the way that we were hoping, there was always a comment, always by one of the legislators saying that woman's story or that personal testimony, whether it was mine or some of the others that, that came with me, um, mine, often got attention, not just because of my, the content of my testimony, but I was always a circus because I would bring in like my four kids with me and I would have like coloring books and snacks and cause I can't pay for childcare at this point. I had just, um, I mean, we were treading water out of poverty, but I was not to the point where we were paying for childcare. 
And so I would bring them all and I'd line them up against the wall and then I'd give testimony. Um, and it was, it was electrifying to me to watch in real time the effect that it has on people. And when I started doing that more and more for different things that I'm really passionate about, the, the biggest one was uh, Medicaid expansion, right? Uh, because we all, three of my four children were born on Medicaid. Um, my fourth was not, and it took us three years to pay off the $8,000 worth of um, debt that we probably would have been covered had Medicaid expansion because we were right in that gap of not being able to afford our own insurance, but making too much to be on Medicaid. Uh, so I was super fired up about it and gave testimony at any opportunity that I could. And people start and people noticed that like, hey, you're you can give testimony. Can you teach other people to do this? And that's when I was given the opportunity to help collect other stories, which turns out to be even more enriching and rewarding and exhausting and <laughs> and terrible all at the same time. So I want to share some of my experiences with that. If we go to the next slide, um, I want to just do a briefly why stories are important. Storytelling is a part of our DNA, right? We It is part of our evolutionary process. It's why we are who we are is because humans tell stories. That's how we relate to each other. It's how we make sense of the world. And I think that's a, I mean, before science told us otherwise, we told stories about what the stars were. We told stories about how the oak tree came to be. Um, and even after science, I think it's important to point out that a good story can convince folks against facts because that is the power of storytelling. There was a study done that when you are engaged, actively listening to someone tell a story, like maybe you're, maybe you're actively engaged with me right now telling stories, our brain wavelengths synchronize. We start thinking the same. And that only happens when you're engaged in listening to a story, not facts. So the fight for Medicaid expansion in Wyoming has been going on for over a decade. And they have, the legislators have been told time and time again, how many single mothers that this will affect, bringing health care to this many people, what it would mean, uh, numbers, statistically, how many people. That's been driven into their brains over and over in many testimonies. But then when I got up there and said, as a single mother, here are the things that I have struggled with. Here is what healthcare has done for me and my family. It clicks, right? We need them both. We do need the facts to back up the stories, but the stories are what give the value to what make the connections between the facts. That's why the storytelling is the meat and potatoes, is everything. This is how you're going. All of all of your organizing and hard work and all of the little things that happen behind the scenes that take hours of, of work, if you don't have a good story to carry it, it's all for naught. So on to the next slide, which I'll talk about. Um, so how to tell stories and not just your own. Telling your own story is important and in order to get other people to tell their story, the most important tool is to have your own. Every time I would get up and give a um, give testimony at a legislative meeting, every single time, I would have folks come up to me after and say, thank you for telling your story. I wanna tell you about my mom. Thank you for telling your story. This is what happened to me. 
when you tell your story, you open the door for other people to be vulnerable. And it is the hardest thing. When I gave my Medicaid expansion story, my like palms were sweaty. I was shaking. I had just listened to 45 minutes of people talking about those people on these programs. And I got up there with a baby on my hip and said, I'm those people. And I was so scared. And I, my voice just shook, just shook. And then after just the amount of letters and emails and phone calls, like, thank you. Thank you. It's horrible to hear that being said about my family, about my past, about my sister. Like, that's the that's how we get people to tell their stories is to be vulnerable ourselves and share our personal experiences. Um, second, listen, listen, listen. I'm going backwards here. You have to listen. You have to allow the space for people to be vulnerable and share their stories. When you're meeting, doing your grassroots work, and if you're meeting weekly, there better be a 20 minute portion of share time. And sometimes that share time is awkward and painful. And that is part of the work is sitting there through it and welcoming it and just marinating in the awkwardness because that's where the beauty comes through, right? Um, I think it's important to emphasize with folks, especially I found uh, my, my personal skills of public speaking, whether good or not, maybe just the fearlessness, the stupidness of being able to get up in front of a bunch of people and making a fool of myself, that not a lot of people want to do that. We need to emphasize that there is more than one way to share your story in those small collective group circles. That's super powerful. You are not just telling stories to change a legislator's mind. You are not just telling stories to change the, the people in power's mind. You are telling your stories to create the movement, to create the, to bring in the people. Because when people say, oh, that happened to me, this affects me too. They're going to come in and they're going to knock doors. They're going to, so you're not just sharing stories in a public sphere. So sharing your story there is important. Um, letters to the editor. If you don't want to give public speeches, letters to the editor are a great way. Um, letters to your legislature, letters to the email chain, to your group email for your organization. Um, that's a less, you, you get to edit it for one. You, <laughs> you get take backs. You can have other people look at it. Is this good? Um, that's a less scary way. And another way, and probably the most effective way, but it is the most work for the organizers, is to have somebody tell you their story and then you transcribe it. If you have, if you have the bandwidth, if you have someone that can be the keeper of the stories, I think it is one of the most vital members of your organization. If they, if that can solely be their job, that's that's the gold right there. If it has to be just part of your communications team, but specifically story collection has to be a building block of these grassroots movements. Because while your door knockers are out, they're going to run into people with stories and they need to have somebody to connect them to, or they're just gonna get lost. You're gonna hear this great story and you're going to put it in your notebook, like follow up with them. And then a million other things happen with grassroots organizing and you're going to forget about them. You have to be able to turn them over to a story bank. Um, and then number four, we must care for our storytellers. Uh, Rob did go into this and he like, I do think that we can get better at this. Um, grassroots organizing, we have to do more debriefing. I know that when people get up and share their very vulnerable, very personal stories, and then the thing that we were working towards doesn't happen, I don't think we can overemphasize the harm that it does when we don't 
have those spaces to debrief and talk about the good that we did do. Maybe we didn't make it across the finish line, but look at this movement that we built. You were a part of that. Sharing your story did this. So I do, I want to end with just emphasizing that we need to be better at that. We definitely need to be better at that. All right. And all of those, all of that was wonderful um, from all three of our speakers. So thank you so much for kind of setting me up for wrapping this up. I don't, you know, I don't even know what to, how to perfect this anymore, except I have a hack for you, I guess. Um, what I'll say is turning your story into policy, it starts at home. It has to start at home. Um, we, we've heard so many uh, just impactful stories in committees and I have left the legislature, I've left to, to go home and I sobbed in my car. Um, I have sobbed in a lot of places because of the stories that I've listened to and taken on and it is an honor and a pr privilege to do so. Um, but I know that not all of my colleagues are impacted in that way. Um, I just I care deeply and I know many of them do. Um, but I also know that a committee room is like, I don't know if anybody here has been in a committee room. Um, they're cold. They're, they don't feel like a warm, safe space. They don't feel like somewhere where we can really connect. Um, there's a desk that keeps me as a lawmaker uh, separate from the rest of the people in the room. And so what I mean by saying that turning your story into policy starts at home is I mean just that. Um, as uh, has been mentioned, we know that our lawmakers here are just more accessible. I'd like to think that I'm very easy to get a hold of, um, that I will go have coffee with whoever. Um, I will go meet with people where they're at. And I think that's true of a lot of my colleagues, even if um, they disagree with folks, I think that they're, they're willing to um, meet with people one-on-one -on -one or in small groups. And, and I, I, I bring this up and it's so clear in my mind because I remember when we passed Medicaid expansion through the house, um, I was a, co-sponsor on that bill. I'm deeply invested in it because I am someone who's gone through that. I've been without health care. I have hospital bills that I haven't paid. Um, those costs are shucked on everybody else, right? But I remember talking to one of my colleagues and it was Representative Kinner. And if you've met him, he's a very kind man. Um, and I, I think that I asked him something. I'm like, how'd you get here? Because he used to not vote for it. Um, and he said, I met with people in my district and they just, I couldn't ignore that. I, it didn't matter anymore what it cost. Um, and that was, it was transformative for him, right? And so while I think sharing your stories in committee rooms is really important, and I definitely think that you should, it's not, you know, don't, don't take this as like, oh, cool, I'm not going to go do it. Um, you should, because it does change people's minds. It also, as a collective effort, just really pushes momentum. And it does all the other things that Marcy said, like gets it in the newspaper, your story's out, and then other people get to know, and you're growing that snowball of, of people who are just going to come in the next year. Um, and a lot of the work that many people are doing, we know it just takes more than once. Um, so to give you some tips or pointers, um, in, I guess, sharing your story at home, because I, I failed to put this in my background, but I, um, I earned my PhD in psychology of the law um, as I was my first year in the, in the legislature. But part of what I did research on was on science communication. How do you, how do you convey to people scientific facts that are politicized and what keeps them from wanting to listen to you? Um, we've all been there. We've shared something that we know it to be true, and they have an, an alternative set of information. Um, and so I want to kind of go, I think, onto the next slide and say, 
first, how you tell your story, how you frame your story is knowing your target. So we know that, um, okay, I need to flip my, my legislator is so-and-so in this district and I wanna have one-on-ones with him because I know he votes no and I want him to change his mind. And how do I make sure that I can do that? How do I make sure my story, even though it's good and it's important and it matters, is going to leave this person feeling like they can't say no to me. And you do that by research. So on our legislative website, which is wyoleg.gov, um, the bottom right, you will find um, senators, representatives, and so you find links. And you can find all these people and you can click on them. So this is what happens when you click on me. You get um, my really cool Western shirt, which is my favorite shirt I wear all the time. Um, <laughs> but you find out, okay, this is this is Carly Provenza. This is who my lawmaker is. Um, and, oh, it looks like she studied psychology. She does research. Um, and then if you were on the actual website, you could click committees. You could find out what committees I'm on and the sponsored bills that I've brought and what do I care about? Um, because we all come in caring about things. And so how can you frame your messaging so that I care more about it? Um, and so knowing your target know, helps you know how you're going to frame your story. Talking about healthcare, you know, talking about Medicaid expansion. Maybe this person has voted against Medicaid expansion in the past and they care a lot about personal liberty. Um, talking about equity or talking about how important it is for uh, mothers to have health care after they give birth for longer periods of time isn't maybe going to work as much as saying having health care is access to freedom. It's liberty. Are you free if you can't go to the doctor? Are your constituents free if they can't go to the hospital because it's closed down because we can't afford it anymore? Um, framing, just kind of framing how you talk about these issues. And the words that you use are critically important. And we'll go on to that next slide. And so this is where some of my research comes in. Um, making sure that your story lands. So oftentimes that I hear from folks when they're, when they're testifying even, they kind of make, they make assumptions based on political party or just whatever, how this person has voted before. Um, but there's assumptions made about who someone is because of other groups that they're in um, or how, how they voted in the past. And so you get into this mindset of like political enemies or someone like this, I disagree with this person on this issue. So I disagree with them on everything. They're not worth saying, like they're not worth lobbying or they're not worth talking to. And I have to say, you have to reject that um, because there are no permanent enemies. Um, it, we're all here on policy. And if we can frame things in ways that don't cause people to see themselves as in group or out group, um, our, our messaging lands better. Um, so I want you to, if you'll play the, the clip real quick. When it comes to politics, Americans can be quite unkind to their opponents. During the election of 1796, supporters of presidential candidate John Adams claimed that backers of Thomas Jefferson were cutthroats who walk in rags and sleep amid filth and vermin. Not to be outdone, when the two men faced off again in 1800, a writer secretly hired by Thomas Jefferson last, sorry, called Adams a hideous cut, from Mac. So let's just scratch it because we're not watching a four minute clip. <laughs> um, basically, what, it what comes he to ends politics, up getting to uh, is that we, we frame people, when we frame people as enemies, then it's different than someone who disagrees with me on an issue because you can change somebody's mind. But if somebody's your enemy, then they don't want you to eat. They don't want you to have housing. They, they, there's, it's, you approach them differently. And so reframing people as having different ideas um, and avoiding activating that social identity at any cost. Um, and I guess to go back to this po the political mindset, uh, this photo of me, um, I'll just kind of walk you through it. 
is a picture from one of the first days of the session. I clearly had like my my witch vibes going on. <laughs> I was uh, I, that conversation doesn't look uh, like we're having a good time because we're not. Um, I was this is Representative Chuck Gray, and so I was talking with him about a bill that he had brought that I had a lot of issues with, and I was explaining to him my issues. Um, and, but we were, of course, cordial and uh, talking about issues about that. Something um, went wrong. Please try again. Oh, something went wrong, said Siri. <laughs> nothing went wrong there. We had our discussion. We, I walked him through my issues with, with that bill. And then we went on to co-sponsor amendments throughout the session together. And this is, and, and people found that funny. They found that interesting because I, they described me as like on totally one side and then Representative Gray's on the other. And so, you know, it, it was, it was, it, my colleagues found it entertaining to see that we had been so far apart and then we were together and we were apart together. But it's this idea that, you know, he's, he's my opponent on these issues, but sometimes he's my friend, um, depending on what that is. And so when you're talking with your lawmaker, you're talking with them, hopefully you get, you know, you get some warm and fuzzy meeting that is um, not like a committee room, you know, it feels, maybe it's a coffee shop that you really like, um, but it's more engaging in terms of like person to person. And that's where the work re can really get done. Um, and your story can really, you can really capture people and make them feel like I am you, we're the same person. Because at the end of the day, we all want the same things. We all want people to, we all want the people of Wyoming to prosper. We want them to be healthy. We just have different ideas about how to get there, right? Um, and so coming to people where they're at, knowing that we can get there if we throw out all the other things that are noise and get to the core issue, which is, you know, your story. Um, nobody can take your story away from you. And it's really impactful, um, particularly when you can remove that other noise of a full committee room that's cold and doesn't feel welcoming. Um, so that's, that's my advice. If you want to get another level up, you find your lawmakers at home um, and you talk to them one on one. And yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Carly. And thank you to all of our wonderful panelists um, for sharing their stories and their thoughts and their tips and experiences today. It's been really great to listen. Um, we don't have any questions that have been submitted yet, but we do have, oh, look at that. Beautiful. That was right on the money, Tasha. Um, so I'm going to start with that question, actually, or it's not a question, it's a thought. Maybe it can be a question. Carly, I know that you're great about answering your um, constituents because I am one of them, but do you think that there's anything anybody can do to maybe get a little more acknowledgement? I mean, I think there's probably a lot of different ways to do it, right? Um, the activist in me says, get louder, make it public that you're not getting responded to. Um, couldn't it be like, hey, I <laughs> write a letter to the editor. I am trying to talk to representative so-and-so and he doesn't return my call. Could someone please let him know that I would like to talk to him? Um, because it's a, I mean, it's public and then it's like, okay, I have to give this person some space because now other people are going to know um, that, I mean, tactically, that's my response. There, I'm sure there's other ways to, to try and do that because I will say to be fair to, um, to myself and my colleagues, um, different things work for different people. I struggle with um, phone calls. So if I get if I get a call and I I found this out earlier I had to reset my iPhone and then I had a bunch of voicemails from the session that I didn't know about and it was like June or May and I'm how oh, I'm not that person but I did not know um, and so 
try different methods. Um, but as you do that, if you've given all of your best effort, then um, think out of the box. Yeah, cool. I'm going to jump to some of our questions that we have from our pre-event questionnaire. Um, and then, of course, uh, attendees, we'd love to hear from you. So you have the option to raise your hand um, or use the Q&A feature or drop a message in the chat. So my first question is kind of for everyone. Um, how do you guys make others that have not shared similar experiences understand and care about your issues and the changes that are needed with them? Really big question, but maybe something that's worked for you all or one or two of you. Yeah. Um, ask questions, ask them questions, find out what's important to them. You will find something with every single person. I know there are, you think that there's no way you have anything in common with that, that person. I promise you, you do. And if you find that one thing that you can have a conversation about, you can, you can relate like Carly said with Liberty, right? Like he doesn't know what it's like to live without healthcare. He's always had healthcare, blah, 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 blah. But I do care about liberty. I do care about reproductive rights. I do care about like find the commonality and build on that. Tie it back to that. I love that. Does anybody have anything else to add? I think I, I'd like to add too that it's not about, um, it's about the dialogue and learning from each other. So we can't possibly all be on the same page about everything all the time. And I can't force my views on you and you can't force your views on me. And so, you know, you just have that very respectful dialogue. That's why I love door-to-door -door canvassing because oftentimes, um, you know, people that really want to dialogue really do want to truly understand the perspectives. And, um, and so then that, that just helps us, right? I'll, I'll come to the uh, what can't we all absolutely have more that we agree on than we disagree on and we all kind of want a better um, we all want a better environment for Wyoming so what does that look like and maybe meeting somewhere in the middle is you know a, a better than than anything so I say yeah listen listen to people even people that that aren't on your same page and, and disagree with you because that's where the best learning can happen. And I'll, I just want to add real quick too, because I, I forgot to mention it when I was uh, in my in my spiel and I was supposed to, um, but to go to Marcy's point, listening, um, we're social animals by nature. It's in our DNA. And when you listen to people and you ask them questions and you're genuinely curious about them and why they think the way they do, especially if they think differently than you, you learn, one, you learn a lot, but two, then we feel obligated to listen. If someone listens to you, do you, I mean, then you also want to listen to them. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you guys. Um, I also really love the idea of finding common ground. Um, so my favorite thing to do is compliment like something they're wearing. Even if you're in the same room, that's like an easy start. Because um, I know sometimes representatives or senators can feel really scary. But if you tell them they have a cool shirt, they're going to smile. And that helps. So my next question, um, I'm going to actually kind of target you out, Rob. Um, this question comes from an attendee with a background in renewable energy, climate change, and public land issues. And um, they'd like to know a little bit more about how to frame, um, issue, frame a story to address issues in kind of that setting. Have you had some success with that that you could maybe share some tips? Yeah, um, I, I think... Um... I think it's incredibly important and it, it, the thing about climate change is that it affects everybody um, and it affects the entire world. So it's pretty easy to have, you know, a personal story about different times that you've interacted with it. Um, specifically on, on renewables um, and building like a new energy economy, I think it's, a, it's really important um, and it's been mentioned by I think a few panelists to not um, not create like a villain in the story that is actually someone who is your neighbor um, or is another Wyoming person. Um, that's something I've seen kind of stumbled into a few times, like 
highlighting maybe uh, like a fossil fuel worker as someone who's doing something wrong when really they're just working a job and trying to provide for their family. So thinking about messaging and, and how you've been personally impacted by climate change, maybe you've actually benefited from fossil fuels and it's important to acknowledge that, that too. That's something that I often lead lead off with. Uh, I went to school at the University of Wyoming. I've benefited from, from the coal industry for in a number of ways, but also have to acknowledge that, you know, millions, if not more, people are, are potentially going to die if we keep burning it. And that's something that I think we need to address. So really getting down again into those, um, into the core values, your core values as a person, um, and trying to connect with, um, you know, emotionally with, with what is actually happening and, and showing that you're not just a kind of a stalwart enviro person, but you actually care about the communities that are going to be impacted as, as, um, you know, we, we make a transition to clean energy is, is really important. Um, so can't, can't uh, you know, give, a, give your own personal story, but those are some tips maybe to, to think about. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, attendees, I'm gonna ask one more question of our panelists before I close this out. So if you have any last questions, now is the time to drop them into the chat and we'll swing back to those. Um, but my last question is kind of for everyone, and it's another big, broad question, because with grassroots and all the work we do, we have some lovely, broad questions. Um, and it's what skills do you find yourself employing the most when you're doing your grassroots? Whoever wants to start can start. Um, I'll go. For me, it's really learning about the issue um, as best that I can, right? All the all the facets of it. So I can be really passionate about something and just say, well, that's what I'm passionate about. So you should be too. But um, really learning about um, the broader issue and, and its impact on, on Wyoming and on, on my community, whether that's local or whether that's just, you know, my, my household and, and that broader um, spectrum of, of issues. So for me, it's really just learning and growing and, and constantly evolving with the issue that's at hand. I'll go. Because <laughs> when, I, when I do grassroots, because I wear so many different hats, um, I'm gonna make sure I got the question. I didn't. It didn't fleet out of my mind. Um, so, you're, you, what what you want to know is like what tactics or what different things we've used, what skills in grassroots. Great. Um, yeah, I the one thing I really enjoy doing um, that has been really impactful is just elevating other people, um, making sure that they have a platform, and that you know that watching people feel empowered by that and like you know because you show up as a community to say county commission meeting and you've got 20 people with you and you know you do we did a uh, an event just like that and we had met before and had coffee and donuts and we walked everybody through what to expect um and i don't think anybody came thinking they were going to say anything but by the time we left that meeting almost everybody who came had something to say, something new to add about why this issue was important to them. And so really just like being able to give people this like feeling of like, no, you matter. And this is your government and this is your house. Like you own this. This is supposed to serve you. And watching that kind of transition of power change, because I think people put lawmakers on a pedestal and then helping them realize like, you have the power, like we're supposed to serve you. Um, just at least it's my favorite. <laughs> Rob, Marcy, would you like to add anything? Go ahead, Marcy. Um, I was just gonna say, I think the skill that I've, utilize the most and have been the most effective is listening just listening listening builds relationships it gives space it finds that common ground uh, especially in today's political climate where we are encouraged to give snappy retorts and real quick comebacks and 
not give an inch, um, we've really lessened and lost the power of listening. And when you listen, you're able to help elevate other people's stories. Um, I think about one story in particular when I was doing story collection for Equality State Policy Center for Medicaid expansion. There's one story, probably one of the most powerful stories. I can't even think about it without crying. Um, and we spent all, I spent a lot of time on the phone with this woman, transcribing her story, writing it for her, helping her prep her for giving a speech. And at the last minute, she decided not to give the speech at a public place. Um, and she was so devastated about it. She felt really bad that she couldn't do it. And she called me crying and um, said, I couldn't do it, I couldn't do it. And I just had to tell her like how much her story meant to me. And I carry that story with me everywhere. And I said, you don't have to tell anybody. And she, and like, you gave me a gift. Like I get to carry that and use that now. And then she in turn said like, well, you gave me a gift because I never got to see my story on paper before. And it was cathartic and helpful for me. Like I processed some things. So that was just a quiet moment and it wasn't big and it wasn't grandstandy and no speeches were given, but it, 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 that's the power of listening. And that's the most important tool. I was just, I was just going to say, yeah, completely agree with everything that's been said. I think one of the most important skills <clears throat> that I've been trying to develop is, is to know when and how to get out of the way as, a, as an organizer and let people speak for themselves. And especially um, what Marcy was just saying, if, if you're able to put the time into helping someone develop their own story, um, and, and even if they don't, aren't able to follow through, if you're there as, as kind of their fallback, their person that they're going to come back to, they're still part of the movement. And I don't know if this is a skill, but actually caring about people is like the number one. If you're an organizer and you don't actually care about other humans, um, that's that should be a huge red flag. I, I know that maybe goes without saying, but it's, it's actually um, maybe more prevalent than I'd like to imagine in the broader organizing space. Um, and, and it, you can really tell when someone's invested in in you personally versus um, just kind of wanting you to be a part of something that they're trying to get do in, in the, at the end of the day. So um, yeah, getting out of the way and, and making sure that you're really centering other people um, as an organizer is a really important skill that is hard to learn, I think, sometimes as well. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I'm going to go ahead and close us out. Um, if anything comes up, feel free to drop it in the chat. But thank you guys for joining our second session of Shape Wyoming. Our next session will be next Thursday, June 23rd at 5, just like this one. Um, and we'll cover lobbying testimony and meeting with lawmakers. So you'll learn uh, how to testify um, both virtually and in person and then uh, tips for meeting with your lawmakers. You can go ahead and register for that at the same link as you register for this, which I did just drop in the chat for you all. And then I'd like to give a reminder that the Equality State Policy Center is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And as such, we rely on charitable donations to do our work. Donations can be made on the web at equalitystate.org, or you can send a check to 419 South 5th Street, Laramie, Wyoming, 82072. We're really grateful to have you all, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your evening.